Health and wellness are big topics today. On an individual level, all of us, you and I, we are concerned about our quality of life. For the government, for businesses, there are also huge financial impacts and economic outputs. So according to the WHO analysis, the global health expenditure now stands at US dollar 8.5 trillion. And by comparison, the wellness industry is valued at 4.5 trillion US dollar, and it continues to grow. So people are very concerned about wealth, health and wellness, and that represents, you know, the wellness industry is 5.1% of the global expenditure output. It's good business there. In Singapore, one in four people will be aged 65 and above by 2030. People are living longer, spending more on health and wellness, but not necessarily happier. Well, today we talk about health and wellness. These are related, but they are not the same. So let me explain. Well, the Bible itself is also not silent on the issue of health and wellness. And this morning, from the Old Testament wisdom of Proverbs, I shall elaborate the following. Point one, complete person and holistic approach. Meaning that the approach to our well-being or our flourishing in life must be holistic because the person is a total entity. And the second point is that our being will impact our well-being. Who you are and the type of person that you develop into will impact your overall, overall well-being. And the third point I will elaborate is about life choices because our choices matter. Our lifestyle practices that Proverbs has identified as vices or virtues will make a difference to the outcomes in your health and in your well-being. Okay, my first point. In the ancient Hebrew understanding, the person or the self, I call it the self, is an integrated total being. We do not separate ourselves into distinct parts like body, soul, or mind. You know, we don't do that. And today, studies in health sciences also adopt a similar holistic understanding of the personhood and approach to healthcare. Thank God for that. In WHO's definition, it says, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. WHO rightly points out that the focus of health should not be just towards bodily or physical needs. The emotional and the psychosocial impact is as critical. Our Bible sheds further enlightenment. Genesis chapter 2 tells us, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. The Bible perspective of personhood is imago deo, that man is created in the likeness of God. The implications are these. First and foremost, that you and I as a person is a spiritual being. Spiritual. Our very existence is intrinsically linked to our inner relationship with God, our maker whose life is in us, who breathes his life in us. So we need to ask ourselves, how healthy is that relationship with God? Because our well-being, according to the Bible, ultimately would derive with your union with God, who is the source of life and the source of good. Secondly, as likeness of God, imigo, there, the human person is a fascinating being of diversity, yet within a unified whole. Every individual, you and I, were uniquely endowed with diverse facets, but each facet will contribute, contribute to you as a distinct person. In the Bible, expressions like body, mind, soul, and all this, 
they do not imply separation of functions. Rather, they represent different aspects of the same person. For instance, we find expressions in the OT where our internal body organs can talk, you know, whether it's the heart, the kidney, the intestine. In the Old Testament, these organs have emotions like compassion, anger, and pain. The prophet Jeremiah, if you recall, when he was emotionally in turmoil, he, speak to his, he says, my bowel, my stomach, I'm pain at my very heart. And then he says, my heart can drum up a noise and I cannot hold my peace. So that's the Hebrew understanding of human being as a total whole and your organs are your, represent you as a whole person. Well, the implication of the person as a unified interrelated whole, the implication then is to adopt a very holistic approach to health, taking into consideration all aspects. So in other words, you talk about health, you should be talking about total well-being. And being healthy then is a very broad concept, incorporating different aspects. These aspects are many and they, are, they can be categorized into different health dimensions. According to different research and studies, the names and the numbers of these dimensions may vary. Some will tell you that there are eight dimensions, some say six, some say 16, yeah? Because the focus on different things. For the sake of today's discussion, I list out eight common dimensions. I say each dimension will incorporate many facets that can either positively or negatively affect health. And the eight dimensions are interrelated, meaning that each dimension will affect the other. And so your total well-being or your holistic health is achieved only when all these dimensions are sufficiently met and they're balanced. So briefly, these are the eight dimensions for your awareness and to understand whether you did devote enough time to attend to them. The first one is physical. Do you have adequate rest? Do you have adequate physical activity? Do you have adequate nutrition to take care of your body? Second, the intellectual. Are there enough opportunities for you to participate in creative activities to expand your knowledge and skills? Third, emotional. Do you have the capacity to cope with life's challenges? Four, the social aspect. Do you have satisfying relationships with others? Do you have a strong support system around you? Fifth, occupational. Talking about your role, yeah? Do you derive, do you have opportunities to derive satisfaction and gratification from your role that you play and the contributions that you can make? Number six, financial. Do you feel secure in your current and your future financial status? Seven, environmental. Do you have opportunities to connect with pleasant and stimulating environments like nature and, well, good space? You know? And last, number eight is a spiritual one. Do you attain a sense of purpose and meaning in life? So the third unique Christian perspective that I like to talk about is that this reality of mankind as fallible and vulnerable. The Bible will enlighten us that we coexist amid the presence of evil and the prevalence of sin. The implication is, on this side of eternity, the world we live in is not perfect. Can you accept that? But it is a reality. The world we live in today is not perfect, and we are vulnerable and fallible. God has decreed that life on earth shall come to an end. Inevitably, every individual goes through certain stages of our life journey. In the context of health, this means that we will resonate between feeling well and falling sick. Some of us will succumb to chronic illness. Most of us will grow old. 
become frail and function, functionally decline. Some of us will suffer health crises that require long-term complex care. All of us will die. So with similar insight, uh, thank God also, uh, with similar insight to the Bible, I would say that Singapore is doing well because our Singapore, our NHG group, group of doctors, you know, and they have come out and laid a comprehensive framework to meet our nation's evolving population health needs, each targeting at every stage of one's life. So I, I like this framework they put down, you know, living well without living well without illness. The second stage is living well with illness, living well with crisis and complex care, living well with frailty, and living well, means dying well. Yeah. The emphasis is rightly placed on well, which means no matter your circumstances and your life stage, it is possible to carry on a state of wellness. The impetus is on us as individuals and collectively as a people to make efforts in the right directions now. This picture is taken from um, a book that I read, uh, The Art of Living and Living Well, by Reverend William Wan, if you want to read here. Yeah. I'd like to state this quote also. Associate Prof. Daniel Fang, CEO of the IMH, very insightfully say so. The well-being and living well is not, it do not equate to illness prevention. There can be unhappy people who are physically healthy. On the other hand, even if I have chronic illness, how I live my life and my relationship with others would be more important in helping me live well. So you can choose to flourish in illness or languish with health. So from the healthcare perspective, briefly, these are the implications. First of all, Take responsibility for your own health. Do not relinquish this role to the medical profession or the institutions. This involves preventive measures. Thank God also, because for the long past, medicine has devoted a lot of resources in developing cure. Now we are shifting back to a balanced emphasis on preventive care. So while you are still healthy, most of us here are, you're still healthy in this living well stage, please devote efforts on proven means that prevent illnesses. Proven means, evidence-based, such as healthy lifestyle choices, good eating habits, physical exercise, physical activity, health screening, vaccinations, don't smoke, don't drink too much, and so on, right? We, actually, we are aware of all these things. You Google also, you know. It's whether you practice them or not. Yeah. Thirdly, do not neglect your emotional or your mental health. Or for that matter, all the other domains of well-being. But I'd just like to highlight this mental and emotional health. Because event, event, inevitably, all of us will face crises in life. We grow old or sudden health crisis that result in long-term dependency. In such circumstances, we will draw from the reservoir within us the resources to manage and to overcome and to rediscover new meaning, new purpose in life so that we can carry on despite our illness or crisis. So this reservoir is needed for you to carry on and flourish in illness. Well, what is, what is involved in emotional well-being? I'm not a psychologist or counsellor. I will briefly say, well, we need to grow in resilience, grow in adaptability, spending time alone, spending time to reflect, preparations for crisis, building deep relationships with significant others, like your friends and your family, to grow your support group. Fourthly, the implication is a concerted effort to forge an informed community that supports those in need. Longitudinal studies have shown the causal relationships between undesirable 
social economic conditions with poor health outcomes. Someone with poor access to health care and education in early life is predisposed to health risk. And so we ask ourselves as a Jubilee community of Christian faith, let's commit to ensure that no individual or no family belonging to our community will lack access to care for their well-being and to care for their education. So I also ask myself, what type of communities, if you're talking about building communities, what type of communities will foster well-being? So this author called Mitch Anthony in a book called The New Retire Mentality. He's talking to people who are going to retire soon, like myself and uh, my peers. So I read this kind of book. The New Retire Mentality highlights five Cs. And these five Cs are important because we, we also plan these five Cs and build these five Cs in our community so that we can retire well. According to him, successful aging means living with vitality. And the mindset of a vitality person is one who will continue to challenge himself. You've got to challenge. You cannot say, I, I'm happy and content. If you have lost that challenge, it's hard to find the vitality in you. So challenge yourself mentally and physically. And the mindset is as if I have many more years to live. Not the mindset is, I'm waiting for the dreary end to come. But I think I have many, 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 many more years to live. Maybe another 50, 60, 70 years. What can I do for that? So I said, let's build a wholesome community here where we can foster and engage people in these five C's of mentality. And the five C's are curiosity. Are you curious? Do you engage in life? Do you dare to try new things? The second is challenge. I spoke about that just now. Which means you have to keep on learning. And then when there are pressures, you cannot escape and say, I don't like pressure, I don't want, pre I don't want challenge. No, take the pressure on, face it, and focus on the process, not the outcomes. So you won't be daunting and say, hey, hey, I don't want to take the challenge, I, I will fail. It's about the process, huh? not the end result. The third C, very important, the connectivity. Build relationships. Relationship is everything. So please keep in contact with friends and family and make effort to keep in contact with those who have lost contact with us. Four, creativity. Reinvent yourself. Participate in arts, music. Be there to problem solve. Think of creative solutions. The fifth one is important. It says charity. Some studies will use the word contribution. It means that the fifth C is very important. This person must be able to give. It's not just take and take and take. The person with the mindset to be able to contribute will find the resource and find the joy in that. So give yourself opportunity to give yourself and resource to others and be positive. Okay, so let me sum up my first point about total personhood and holistic approach. You are a fascinating being created in the likeness of God with diverse and interrelated aspects within a unified whole. A holistic approach is needed for a wholesome and flourishing life. As an individual and as a community, as a people of God, as a nation, we've got to take ownership and take responsibility for our well-being. The world is not perfect. Man is fallible and we will succumb to life crisis. The fifth point, man is a spiritual being. And in the Bible's narrative, the root cause, the root cause of total well-being, the root cure, I won't say root cause, huh, is the spiritual aspect, our relationship with God. So let me move to the next point, which says that being impacts well-being. And this is the key passage for today's re uh, reflection. The key passage. If you forget what I said just now, at least remember this. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 23. My child, be attentive to my words. 
Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with vigilance, for from it flows the spring of life. You are created in the likeness of God. Your total self, you can't imagine it and you can't conceive it without an awareness of your dependence, your utter dependence upon God, who is our creator. Because ultimately, the joy and the satisfaction over and beyond above crisis will result from a union, your union with God, who is the source of flourishing life and well-being. The heart, it says here, guard your heart, represents the totality of the person. And wisdom exalts us. He says, spare no effort. Give it all to take care of, take guard of this total, this you, this total self. Your true self, your inner person. Because this is the, the reservoir from which flourishing life will pour out, from which you will draw the resource from God. Yeah. We can derive two insights from these proverbs on what this guarding means. One insight comes from Proverbs 3, 7 and 8. It says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear God and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. The second Proverbs is chapter 3, verse 1, 2. My child, do not forget my teaching. Don't forget my teaching. And then, the length of days and the years of life and the peace they will add to you. So the, the implications are this. First of all, you are exhorted to exercise your will. You choose what paths to take, what lines of actions for various circumstances. You make decisions on how you wish to conduct your life. Not God choose, you choose. And secondly, it says that the wise person chooses to fear God and shun evil. Because he acknowledged God as a source of wisdom, the wise person will say, I honour God, I will submit to his ways. I will live life obeying and adhering to God's teachings. Because I accept this as really, really good. I really think that they are very good. I feel that they are good. I honour them. I will do exactly and obey as he says. And this wise person also, by obeying, shuns evil. Which means, again, a choice. There is a very determined commitment that you will break away from everything that God has declared or decreed as unwholesome or no good. So there's no ambiguity. Anything that God says, do not touch, do not what, it's no good. I'm just not going to venture in and be curious about it. That, that one, no need to be curious. Huh? Yeah. All right. So as a result of allegiance to God, God says, the length of days, the years of life, and peace will be added to you. And so the person who chooses to fear God and shun evil is enriched in fullness in every way. This peace or shalom that it talks about, it is the expression of wellness in the Bible. Shalom depicts wholeness and completeness. Not just the absence of hostilities, but an inner sense of calmness, tranquility, someone who is at rest, at contentment. Shalom flows from all of our relationships being put right. Relationships put right with God, with myself, with others, with the environment. In other words, fundamentally, shalom then is about reconciliation. It's about relationship. It's about reconciliation with God. Because it is God who gives us peace with himself. How you relate to God, our maker, will influence the way you relate to others and how you respond to situations. 
And eventually, how you repeatedly, repeatedly conduct yourself shall develop you into a type of personality. And so to a certain extent, we can even say that the behaviours may shape a person's character. So to summarise my second point, I would say, choose. Choose who you want to be. Choose right. As Imigo Dei, image of God, we are created for a relationship with God. And He gives us volition, the ability to choose. And He calls us to please choose well, to exercise your will wisely. Choose allegiance to God, to fear Him and to shun away from evil. This leads to shalom, the wholeness and the fullness. Proverbs will provide practical guidance and examples on good and bad choices. This brings me to my final and my third point, which is about life choices. And they matter. The choices we make will offer insight to what type of person you are or who you will become. Because it tells me, it tells us what we value in life. We are not talking just about profound, big choices like who we desire for a life partner, or what kind of long-term work, career or vocation. We are also talking about day-to-day -day choices. How am I going to spend my next three hours? How, how do I spend on my next meal? How do I spend on other people? Small choices as well. The choices we make can affect change. And the personal choices that you make regularly will shape your behaviour and eventually develop into a certain kind of character. So this psychiatrist called Willing Glasser, he has this theory called choice theory. And he demonstrated that there are four elements of choice will work together to make up who we are and how our lives may evolve. The way we think and the way we act will in turn influence the way we feel. And these three things, think, act and feel, he posits that it can eventually also even alter your physiological state. Yeah, how you think, how you feel and act may make some changes to your biology being. Yeah. And he tells us that each of us has direct control over how we choose to act, to feel and to think. And so Proverbs, being practical wisdom, sheds light on what constitutes good and bad choices. For the ease of discussion, we call them virtues, we call them vices. The four cardinal virtues which we are exhorted to live well are these four. Prudence, justice, fortitude and temperance. The theological virtues are three. Sing Wang Ai, love, hope and faith, charity. The seven vices that were listed are pride, lust, Gluttony, avarice, sloth, anger, envy. I will not elaborate on this uh, because we are reflecting on these vices and uh, virtues in greater detail in cell groups. My cell group already started discussing on um, justice and prudence. Yeah. So you do please participate actively in your cell group discussions. In the context of health and wellness, Proverbs gives us two dispositions that I would like to highlight this morning. Proverbs 14, verse 30. The first disposition is calmness. The proverb says, A tranquil heart is life to the body, but passion is rottenness to the bones. This is a very interesting proverb. If you break it into Hebrew, Literally, it just contains seven nouns. There are no verbs, just nouns. And they say life, flesh, calmness, heart. So these four. Rottenness, bones, jealousy. No verbs, just nouns. So the reader will have to, you know, kind of put the link between these seven nouns or seven objects. Yeah. Eventually, you know, the reader comes to the conclusion, oh, he's talking about the calmness of the heart will bring life to the flesh. And rottenness comes from the passion 
of envy. So this disposition of calmness is also not easy to translate. In the original Hebrew, it denotes a composure of tranquility, soothing, bringing healing. It says that no matter the external circumstances, the person chooses to cease or to stop contention and strife. Instead of misgivings, this person chooses to focus on every good thing or every goodwill that has happened and every undeserved grace that has experienced. So the heart is disciplined to the incline towards contentment and is infused with gratitude and thanksgiving. A discipline in growing this disposition brings life to the body. In contrast is the disposition of passion, which is filled with envy and jealousy, where one is always constantly comparing yourself with another. And then in the comparison, feeling so unjustified and so unsatisfied with your lot in life. It keeps on compelling you to want to keep striving or scheming to get ahead or to gain the upper hand. So this unsatiable chasing, the Bible says, is the path towards decay and decline in the well-being. Maybe encourage each other to grow in this disposition of calmness. The second disposition is joy. As a healthcare worker in the larger scheme of elder care, my current uh, vocation commits me to a lot of reflection and projects towards delivering um, total well-being to our elder, our aging population. So that's my job. Yeah, my task is always to think about, you know, what's my KPIs, how to bring joy you know, to, to the population. So all the stakeholders that we are involved in our discussions, whether locally, internationally, always talking the same thing. The desired end goal is always towards bringing joy to the individual at whatever stage of life he or she is in. Because all of us acknowledge that we may no, not be able to change our circumstances, our health, we all know we will fall ill and grow old. But joy, joy is something that every human being can experience. And joy is something that every human being can bring to another person or can share with another person so that he or she can experience joy. Proverbs 15, 13, it says, why joy is so important? A joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart or the person is sad, spirit is broken. Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. When the spirit is broken, a broken spirit dries up the bones. So then it comes back to this issue then, how, how do I have joy? Where is joy? From a Christian perspective. There is more to life than choosing our own goals to enjoy our life on earth. Come back to this fundamental issue of why God created us. What's the meaning of our life? Well, God created you and I to experience joy. Not merely to exist, but to enjoy and to flourish in life. And to do so is only through communion with Him and the world that he has created. In the Reformed theology, this shorter catechism, it asks this question of every believer. He says, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And to glorify God, it's not like God is very glorified and I still try to add on to his glory, not add to his glory, to glorify God is to live in such a way that honors Him in every way and by doing so, declare His gloriness to everybody who see us and hear us. And to do so is to live a life of obedience to God, not trying to hide His glory behind clouds of disobedience. And to enjoy God is being so delighted with Him and loving God for who He is finding him to be really the sole source of our deepest satisfaction and our pleasure, thanking him for that. And this enjoyment comes as a consequence of you daily doing things that glorify him, 
honoring him, choosing to respond in ways that obey his teachings in everyday activities. So in sum, the person who is restored to God, restored to God, reconciled to him, experiences true peace and experiences true joy in God's presence. Uh, let me conclude this morning's reflection. First of all, any discussion on well-being must stem from the understanding that we are spiritual beings created in the likeness of God. Health and wellness are affected by the choices that we make. Exercise wisdom and take responsibility to take care of our well-being and those we love. Science in medical care has established healthy lifestyle practices that can prevent health risks such as physical activity, good eating habits, growing your social-emotional network. Will you practice this? Last and not least, this morning's Bible informs us that the root to all well-being and flourishing stems from a right relationship with God. Will you devote efforts for this and take the right care of your relationship with God? Let us pray. Loving Father, we give thanks to you. You are our God and you have chosen us. You are the source of life and the source of wellness. You are also our healer. Look into our darkness today, Lord, the different dimensions in our totality, our being. What are the areas that we are having trouble with, struggling with? May you come upon us today, your presence, to heal us, to enlighten us, encourage us and spur us on to make the right choice and to make decisions along your way. And therefore, we enjoy your presence and therefore, we enjoy the peace that comes from you. Pray for, pray for our brothers and sisters here and I pray all this in Lord Jesus' name. Amen.